Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, this is just they're looking at like some texture synthesis here. I'm going to show you more of this stuff later today, and we'll actually have a, a lesson about this in a few in a few weeks. Um, I just want to kind of start with some basic logistics stuff and tell you first of all what the course is about. Um, this class is basically about machine learning for creativity and, and art, right? And design and interaction design things things of that sort. We're going to deal with a lot of like interactive and real-time stuff, things that are probably in everybody's wheelhouse, like very, very much in the ITP spirit. And we're also going to look at uh, generative models and things that are a little bit more connected to like, um, like more experimental uh, sort of stuff going on in deep learning and cer certain special topics that we'll kind of pull out later in the semester. And um, the agenda for today is just going to be like, uh, first I want to do kind of like a round of introductions so, so that I can kind of get to know you, get to know everybody here. Hopefully I learn everybody's name in the, within the next week. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the course logistics. And then um, today should be like kind of like a nice introduction. I'm going to do something that I call the whole course in 60 minutes. Um, I'm putting that in quotation marks because I have like 110 slides. So there's no way that it's going to fit. But you know, it'll, it, but I'm going to try to, we, we won't go the entire uh, three hours today because you know of course we're meeting again tomorrow so I don't want to torture you too much like six hours of class in two days I figure I should like wait until at least October to torture you um, so let's let's kind of like well th and this should be like we're not going to learn any any skill stuff today I just want to show you like what is so exciting about this field why is everybody um, so interested in it and, and hopefully kind of get you um, excited for the next semester um, and also, I just want to, of course, apologize for the really strange schedule. I know that like 9 a.m. is very unnat unnatural here. Um, it certainly is for me uh, because I couldn't be here all of last week. So we kind of struck this deal to uh, move the first class to today, um, whereas it should have been last Tuesday. Um, starting tomorrow, of course, we'll be here from, from 12 to 3 every, um, every Tuesday, except for a few. This is a 12-week class instead of a 14-week class. I know there's kind of a... Um, a little difference there between the, the, those two types of classes. So there will be a couple of weeks where I'm not here. Um, uh, you should also know I am a resident here, so I'm one of the SIRs, the something in residence. So I'm going to be here quite a lot. And I'm hopefully going to create some more, um, some more ways of kind of adding, adding things to this class. Like I'm, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and then this is the schedule. I think you have it probably somewhere in your, in your resources. Basically every Tuesday, except that we're going to miss two uh, weeks in a row in October. So there'll be like a long break between September 25th and October 16th. One of those is a scheduled week that is um, that there's no Tuesday classes that week. And one is a week that I'm gone. So I decided to make one of the gap weeks in the 14 week schedule uh, to be that week. Um, and, then, and then later in November, there'll be also a week that I miss. Um, and then we'll, we'll be ending basically at the same time as all the rest of the classes. Um, so um, let's talk first about logistics and then I'll kind of start like blasting your brains with cool machine learning stuff. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to note that I am recording. So I'm screen recording my class. I'm going to be putting all the classes online for, for you and for other people who, who wish to keep up with it. Um, so just a, a note that like we'll, we'll um, like if there's any, uh, if we have discussion periods or if you say something that you don't want to be included in the recording, just come talk to me and I'll make sure to remove it. Um, like when we do the introductions, I won't include that in the video. It'll be mostly focused on just materials that people outside of the class might find useful. So that's, um, that's the purpose of these recordings. Um, I'll also be putting the slides online. That's the first time I'll be able to do this because I'm begrudgingly using Keynote right now. I usually use open frameworks for, for all my slides. Uh, but I, I'm, but it's a it makes it a little tricky to to share the slides. So I've actually um, I've reverted to Keynote, and um, I'll be putting a lot of the course materials on uh, ML4A, which is this website. I'm, I'll, I'll show you that in just a little while. Um, so most of that stuff will be online um, as part of the ML4A collection, um, and uh, office hours. Uh, so those are. To, uh, to be determined. I'm trying to figure out exactly how I should do that. I, I might try to use a sort of scheduling app. In general, I'm going to be here quite frequently. So I might just kind of like make uh, office hours like all the time, more or less, like just kind of open, open walk-in um, rather than having like a dedicated period. But we'll see. I'm going to figure that out tomorrow. 
Um, now, I'll show you the syllabus in just a moment, but first I want to talk about a little bit about the, like, what we'll be doing with these lectures. So um, the, the way that I want to do things, this is, a, uh, this is 12 weeks. I, I taught here two years ago, and it was a seven-week class, and a lot has changed um, sin, since uh, two years ago. And actually, the class that I taught here two years ago was um, the start of ML4A, so it's actually like really, really awesome to be, to be back here to kind of follow up on it. Uh, but a lot has changed. Like there's a, a lot of incredible new tools. A lot of the best, the coolest tools that um, I'm very excited about for this class are actually being developed right here uh, by people that you know. So, and I'll be introducing those later. Um, so that's really awesome. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to like do practical stuff. Um, two years ago, the, the class that I taught here was very, very lecture, like very, very theory heavy. And I'm going to try to kind of like get people making stuff um, as, as early as possible. Um, that being said though, um, I have kind of like conflicting, like what I, I also want to um, not just rush ahead to how to make things, but I want everyone to kind of like stop and, and think about what makes some of this stuff so beautiful. It's very unlikely that, that uh, improbable that any of this stuff works at all. And so to appreciate it at a theoretical kind of mathematical level is something that I'm going to stress here. Like tomorrow we're going to look at something like linear regression, you know, like which is, you know, like probably not very much in the spirit of ITP because ITP is very much like get your hands dirty. Um, but uh, it really, really helps so much if you know a little bit about the underlying math because then you know how to bend these things to your will um, rather than kind of using them as, as, as black boxes. Um, so to that end, I'm going to stuff the lectures, like these lectures, with, with a lot of just like um, both, both lecture, like about the theory, and also demonstrations, and less like tutorials, like what, or in the sense that I want to do like, like things like, like I do something and then wait for everyone to, to do it. it doesn't, I find it doesn't really, it works nice in a one day workshop, but in over the length of the class where people have time between the lectures, what um, it makes sense to, to do the, to do that stuff between the between the weeks and make use of this time as much as possible, and to that end, I'm going to actually be creating like supplementary videos that I'll be giving to you that include like the stuff that I might normally do here, but I just because I want to reserve this this class for more um, like discussion and theory rather than um, tutorials. I'll be putting the I'll be putting extra tutorials online. So like one of the first ones I want to do is just like a a primer on using terminal and using the command line and getting started with Jupyter uh, Python notebooks. I'll explain all that stuff later this week. So I'll be releasing videos um, to that end. Uh, they're, they're not they're not actually here yet, but um, but I'll be announcing that later. Let's really quickly look at the syllabus. Um, let me actually get out of here and uh, okay. So this is like a draft syllabus. I want to kind of go through it really quickly so you get a sense of what we're going to do. The class, uh, the, the syllabus is actually, um, is kind of tentative. It's going to change as we go for two reasons. One is because uh, I don't uh, necessarily know how much everything will fit into each lecture, so things might get shuffled around. Um, and also, like, not everything is planned exactly yet because one thing I've learned about this topic is that um, within the space of three months, at least two or three like monumental, incredible things will will be will happen in this field during the course of the, during the course. And so, like to stay flexible and kind of integrate those things into the class is um, something that I try to do. So this is very very tentative, um, and you can go through the actual like the details uh, later on your own time. But just to give you like a first order approximation, kind of what we're gonna we're, we're gonna look at this semester is um, the first two weeks, like tomorrow and next week, will be devoted to studying neural networks, like understanding how neural networks work, how they are trained, and doing some, some basic things. We'll probably bring in ML5 into the, into the uh, lectures, um, and uh, trying to understand their properties and their, and their basic applications. And that will kind of like bleed into the third week, which will be talking about sort of very base level applications of, neur of uh, neural networks applied to applied mainly to like information retrieval. So like if you're dealing with data sets, how can you use neural networks to extract features, to analyze the contents of your data so that you can do uh, like, like basically retrieval tasks on them. And that sounds like very, very um, 
like not important for the kind of things that we'll be doing later, but it's actually a very, very gen generic sort of task, like very, very general properties of neural networks that, that end up being um, kind of the lowest level, uh, like the base layer of every one of the higher level applications that we'll be introducing later. So, um, so that's, that's kind of what will be, yeah, what will be, let's say next week and the week after. Um, a lot of these things are going to blend together. So like the, the week after that is called interactive machine learning, where, where we're going to get into like things like Wekinator and ML5 and um, talk about real time, things that we can do in real time with neural networks, you know, train neural networks. And actually, like really a lot of this stuff will probably even be starting next week. So a lot of these, these classes kind of will blend together. I'm, I'm making up the exact materials as I go. So, um, so these are, again, like first order approximation. We'll talk a little bit about audio and text applications as well. Uh, most of the theoretical materials are going to center around images for two reasons. One is because that's kind of where a lot of the most uh, developed stuff happens to be, um, but also because it's, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. You get, a, of course, a visual understanding of things. Um, audio and text are a little bit harder in machine learning because they both deal with sequences and time. And that kind of like makes everything much more difficult. Um, nevertheless, there are a lot of really interesting things that we can do with audio and text, and we'll be introducing those, I think, in, in that week. Um, and then um, one of the things that, and this is, this is one of my favorite topics, uh, I, I like a lot of these um, sort of optimization-based approaches to making visual art. Uh, that won't make any sense right now. Like we're of course gonna, I'm gonna tell you what that means actually a little bit later today when we introduce those things uh, in some of the slides. Um, but the but things like Deep Dream and uh, the original style transfer, maybe some of you are already familiar with if you if you're interested in the topic, um, we'll we'll devote a week to those things because there's actually a lot of really open ended uh, open ended ways of taking that, um, and and that will actually be a good. Um, a good prelude to the next big module of the course, which is generative models. So, um, uh, so I, if I had to like divide the whole class into kind of two rough categories, I would say one is interactive real time stuff, and the second is um, mostly non real time uh, generative models, which is learning uh, how to synthesize samples of it from a data set. For, um, synthesize new samples that look like they came from data set. There's going to be a lot of interplay between those two. We'll be able to kind of integrate some of the generative models into our real-time workflows, but, but it's, it's kind of a separate topic. Uh, and it's one that is like probably the most cutting edge uh, aspect of this class. Uh, generative models were prohibitively difficult, like as recently as three or four years ago. And now, um, you know, now they're actually like, rapidly advancing and being in, and being placed into a lot of interesting applications. So we're going to actually spend a few weeks on generative models. So that includes things like, you know, training your own GANs and autoencoders on data sets. Um, also things like uh, picks to picks, which some of you may already be familiar with, like ch generating, uh, like, uh, you know, creating neural networks that convert one kind of image into another kind. There's a lot of really, really, um, really interesting stuff in that in that uh, module, and then there'll be kind of like a, a series of special topics that I'm going to that that we'll probably kind of figure out later in the course, like which ones to include. Un unfortunately, like we just can't do everything in this topic, like in the short class. It's it's a really, really large topic. I've been struggling to figure out exactly what what to cut and what not to. So in, it's possible that there's actually already too much stuff in the syllabus. I left one week blank, um, so that's actually going to help us um, uh, figure it out, but, but things may get pushed as we go. Um, the special topics uh, may include things like reinforcement learning, uh, and, and that one, there's a pretty good chance that we'll, we'll have some, some of that in, within this class just because it's, it's super interesting. It's a little bit out of my, I don't actually do a lot of reinforcement learning my, myself, so because it's a little bit out of my own expertise, it may not be a huge component in this class. That could change by November though, because um, they're all interesting things to me. And, and so we'll kind of, and, and also a lot of people here might have uh, relevant skills that I don't have that will actually make it um, very much like applicable. So uh, is anyone here developing in Unity? 
And the Unity developer, a few people do some Unity stuff. Well, there's like really cool stuff uh, with reinforcement learning agents in Unity that I, I really would like to investigate. I haven't at all, so I don't know too much about them, but um, that stuff could be could actually be really, really cool. And then there's a topic that is, uh, is probably the most out of left field topic for this course, and I don't know if it'll actually be a part of this class. It will be a part of some of the other things that I'm planning on doing here. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about this lab section thing that I have, uh, this idea for a lab section um, in just a moment, but that might be where I end up putting this decentralized AI module. I've become really interested in um, this sort of interplay between machine learning and AI and uh, also like decentralization technology, peer-to-peer -peer networks, things like that. Um, there's a lot of really, really interesting new ventures that have kind of sprung up in the last two years that are trying to uh, change very much like, like from the protocol level up how uh, we interact with machine learning models online. And a lot of it has very interesting properties. I know this like sounds very vague. I promise that there's like actually a lot of really interesting things inside of that, but, but we'll, we'll probably kind of get to that later in the semester. So I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll mention it maybe in a couple slides later um, today. And yeah, and then this will kind of take us to the end. And you know, we I know the there's an ITP show, and I'm hoping that you guys are able to like, and and, and I'm thinking to have final projects. Actually, that's something that um, that's something we'll also need to talk about. Maybe tomorrow we'll kind of let leave that aside until tomorrow, uh, but we'll talk about that um, in just a bit. Okay, um, getting back to this stuff. So yeah, let me let me go through the logistics, and then we'll take a moment to kind of introduce everybody. Um, so uh, we looked through the syllabus. Uh, as I said, not everything is planned yet. A little bit about tools. So just so, you, so everyone knows um, the, the tools that we'll be using for the practical materials in this class. So we'll be using some of the deep learning frameworks. So you, you might already be familiar with things like uh, Torch and TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras. Uh, how many people are familiar with at least one of the things that I just said? Okay, handful of people. I, I, I don't mean familiar, like you've heard of it, like you, you know what it is. Okay, um, so we're not gonna learn how to code TensorFlow. That's beyond the scope of this class. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of work with a lot of modules that we interact with from, from either from the command line or from let's say like um, almost like an API like within that you might be able to call from your favorite coding framework. We'll be doing some Python stuff probably not within the lectures again like I'll be releasing supplementary materials um, we'll also be using uh, uh, like JavaScript stuff so I know a lot of people are really interested in doing things inside of the browser uh, and there is a really I'm super excited about ml5 how many people here know about ml5 okay okay everybody basically um, ml5 is a really really fantastic new JavaScript library that's being developed by Chris and Yinning and I guess also contributors here um, and uh, that will, and it's sort of like the, it, you might say it's um, what processing does to Java, ML5 does to TensorFlow.js, and that's the JavaScript version of TensorFlow. It makes it really, really easy for us to integrate machine learning components, like, like um, you know, kind of like modules, into web applications, and I know a lot of people here are probably doing a lot of web stuff, so that's going, and it's going to, I think, be very much uh, complementary to some of your other classes. Um, so that's that's actually something that I'm hoping to promote, like, because the thing about machine learning is that it's such a general thing. It's like a very, very base layer, kind of applicable to every field. And so you might find yourselves thinking about integrating these tools into your other classes. That, that would be, I think, like an ideal scenario. Uh, we're going to use uh, Runway, uh, and uh, of course, Runway is also being developed by Chris Valenzuela, who's here. Um, and I'm really excited by Runway. I think Chris has said that there's going to be a beta version coming out this month, um, which which will be really which will be awesome for us. I'm hoping that uh, if you see him around in the hallways, it'd be like, hey, how's that how's that beta application coming? Because because I don't think it's out yet. Well, he's pretty busy, so so we'll see. But hopefully, we'll have it we'll have that to play with. Uh, and then we'll also be, we'll see how much we, Wackinator stuff we do. A lot of the, I used to uh, use Wackinator a lot for, um, for a lot of my workshops, but, um, but right now there's a lot of the use cases for Wackinator actually have been absorbed into ML5 and Runway. So um, 
we'll probably I'll probably do some I'll probably release some supplementary materials and also point you to Rebecca Fiebring's course if you're interested in using Weaponator. Um, that'll definitely be a part of the class, but probably not as much. Uh, it was a really, really big part of the last class that I did, and I think th this time it won't be as much. Um, I have a collection of modules. Oh, that should say ML4A, not AML4A. Um, a collection of open frameworks modules, which uh, do various uh, tasks for us that will help you create interactive applications on your computer. Uh, so between those and Runway and Wekinator, we have a lot of like really, really high level tools, um, which, which is great because, you know, we could be making stuff within the span of the next two weeks, basically. Um, whereas, you know, we don't, whereas two years ago, it would have been like, we would have had to wait seven weeks until we could, we could do anything. Um, and then uh, we'll be, and, and processing will also be probably like, um, there'll be some processing involved also, like especially as uh, it relates to Wekinator. Wekinator and processing, I often use them together. This is a new library that I've actually just started kind of uh, working on with uh, a collaborator in Denmark, uh, ML4Pi. So I think you can imagine what that is. That's basically how many people here are doing Raspberry Pi stuff? Okay. So um, right already right now I have a basic script that lets you train like a, like a basic classifier on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm not a big Raspberry Pi person myself, so I'm not 100% sure I did it right, but it seems to, seems to basically work. Um, and, and maybe we'll do a tutorial about that later. This is really new, so, so it might not, it's still kind of buggy, um, but um, I'll show work by, the, by my collaborator who's working on this uh, in just a little bit. There's also a bunch of other creative coding libraries um, that, that, um, that have sprung up in the last few years. Um, some of them, their names are actually escaping me at the moment, but um, for those of you who are using other, especially like JavaScript frameworks, um, feel free to like bring them in. Like we don't, we don't have to restrict ourselves to any of these tools. There's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of like other tools that will be very much like in the spirit of the material that we'll be looking at. And yeah, as I said, like I'm, I, I'm not, I haven't used Unity myself, so I don't know that much about it, but like, I, but Unity is like a fantastic, you know, environment and has some support for machine learning stuff that, that is kind of um, in the pipeline, I think. And so uh, hopefully we can place that in. I don't know exactly, you know, if we'll run out of time before we really can do much of that stuff, but feel free to like, to like investigate that in your own time and, and bring it into our projects. And then, uh, and then possibly Magenta also. Magenta is something that I also have not used, uh, but it may be like for people who are interested in music stuff, um, that will probably be also relevant. And um, okay, assignments and projects. So like I was thinking that, uh, and maybe this is why the last week should be blank, is um, to try to have like basic final projects. I know that's, that you, you do that generally for most of your classes, right? There's like a final project, right? So I think it would make sense to reserve that last week um, for just presenting them. And you know, a lot of things, they can be just prototypes. Like for me, the goal isn't necessarily to develop something you know, really, really complicated. Like I would even, um, you know, if you have three small projects rather than one large one, that's also very valuable. Um, really the point of this is to try to get like the, the juices flowing, um, you know, because of course, like one of the big aspects of ITP that I really, really like is the rapid prototyping. You know, you're not making things that are built to last. Um, you're making things that, that, that can iterate quickly and kind of stay current. Um, and with machine learning, that's just like that to the nth power because, you know, this field is moving so fast that like almost everything that we are going to teach in the next few weeks will be obsolete by the end of the class. So um, that's something to look out for. Um, I know, okay, so auditing. Uh, I know a couple of people are auditing the, the course, uh, which is great. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I don't know uh, exactly what ITP's regulations are, but I'm, I'm completely happy for, for as many people to just come like hang out in this class as possible. So you don't even have to ask permission. It's like completely fine. Um, now, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, like my understanding is this class was like quite popular, like a lot of people placed it as their top selection. And so I've gotten emails like from some people who didn't get in. So I want to make the following uh, plea, basically, like if um, if you uh, like if your motivation for taking this course is you want to be doing stuff as we move along, like you really want to make it a big part of your your course load here, then that's great. Um, if you're if you feel like this is kind of more for later for you like you're you know You have maybe too much going on right now. I know everyone's got you know their their finals to think about 
um, then consider dropping the class and auditing it so that somebody who like really really wants to be here could get in uh, because I'm recording everything literally everything all of the materials are going to be online so there should be no difference between being registered for the class and not being registered in the class at least insofar as like everyone help will have access to the basic materials um, so it's really like if you I guess the better way to put it is if you plan on really investing a lot of effort into the final project that that's really like the reason to be taking the class otherwise like you should be able to to um, yeah like get as much as you can from uh, for just from auditing it or watching the lectures later or things like that um, so this is this is today's like the try it before you buy it fa uh, period so um, so this is and that's why the next course is going to show you like literally everything we're going to do um, and then the last thing, uh, this one I'm really excited about. So I've been thinking about trying to create some sort of an informal lab. And the lab would not necessarily be like uh, partnered with this, with this class per se. It would be open to other people at ITP, especially like the people who couldn't get into the class. And I'm not sure exactly how to structure it, um, but it would maybe involve like something much more loose and informal, much less me talking and more like people bringing in stuff that they're, that they're interested in. I would, I'm sure that like in the next week or two, everyone's got a lot going on, but hopefully like I'd love to kind of like, uh, well, yeah, that, that's kind of all, that, that's really all I, I know to say about it right now. Uh, I, I guess I'll maybe ask some of you later, like what might be the best way logistically to set that up. It would be nice to like figure out if there's a way to get a room um, or something of that sort. Okay, so let's get to like the whole class in 60 minutes and and there's like yeah like i said there's like 100 slides and i'll probably some of them will be slides that i put up for just a few seconds um and and the way we'll do this like we'll we'll take a break at some point um i, I think like we'll try i'll try to cut it in half and then leave leave a little bit of time for we'll, we'll have, in general we'll have like a break every class because it's three hours long and that's crazy um, my my goal is to for this class to end a little early today to give you a little bit of breathing room. So I hope this takes us only until eleven, let's say, or like a, between eleven and eleven thirty. I hope. Um, but um, and yeah, so that to that end, like we might go through some of. The, I might just say like one or two words about the the idea of the, the next sixty slides is, or a hundred slides is basically like this is all the stuff that is part of this field and is most likely to be part of the course. And so it's just gonna, it should be just like, what's exciting about this field? It should get, your, get you uh, excited about it. That's really the goal. It's not, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna show you any like technical material right now. It's just all gonna be like, what's exciting about this course? And then, um, and yeah, like I said, like, and, and also just feel free to interrupt me or uh, if you have a remark or a comment or a question, um, that's that's also like just just raise your hand and, and we'll stop um, so so okay like this is the, mo the most pedantic thing I can make part of this course is like what is machine learning <laughs> like we're in some sort of philosophical seminar and and all machine learning really is is it's like it, it first of all the bounds of machine learning are not clear it's like it really refers to a lot more things than than it used to let's say and but you could say that it's it's an approach to solving uh, problems that are relevant to artificial intelligence, and the way that you, uh, the way that AI, uh, the way that machine learning is distinguished from other approaches to a AI, AI, is that they are usually learning uh, how to do perform tasks based on data, and that's in contrast to what you might consider an expert-based system, uh, which is sort of you have rules encoded into it. Um, and that generally favors some sort of innate structures. It's really interesting how it, with machine learning, the, uh, the kind of like the, the principal axis on which that you might find there's like two camps of machine learning, uh, how, how they disagree is very similar to how, is very similar to the one that exists in, in like cognitive, um, in, in like a more cognitive psychology fields and like kind of like innateness versus learning, right? So like how much, do you trust rules and structures that are that are kind of like pain, painstakingly co encoded versus learning from scratch, uh, learning from data? And machine learning leans heavily on learning from data and deep learning, uh, which I'm going to introduce in a few slides, leans extremely heavily on learning from data. So basically deep learning makes almost zero assumptions about anything in the world and then kind of learns just from example. Um, there is a lot of disagreement over whether or not that's a, that can lead us kind of to the golden period of AI, you know, that sort of 
um, goal that's that's always kind of like just on the horizon, but always you know retreating from from where we are. Um, but generally, we're living in that period where the dominant way of doing AI is machine learning to the extent that machine learning and AI have become almost like interchangeable terms. Um, AI itself also does not mean the same thing that it used to. AI used to just mean computer science basically uh, because when AI was invented it was like, oh look, a computer can sort, you know, that's like it's doing something that a human would and now no one thinks that that is as AI. So it's always kind of a moving, um, moving target you might say. And uh, in general, like almost, um, it, it, you, you could see this as like a very, very, um, you know, if, if you had to kind of pigeonhole everything in this field into uh, some sort of a like basic structure, is the idea is that we learn functions from data. Uh, fun and data is X, you know, basically X and sometimes Y. And we learn functions using uh, using learning uh, using learning algorithms and we'll talk about more uh, like in more specifically how those learning algorithms work over the next two or three weeks uh, but for today we'll kind of view it as a sort of like black box which we'll call f right um, now uh, in the funny thing is that when ai kind of began in, uh, in the 1950s the way the term machine learning did not yet exist um, but the way of doing uh, the way of actually doing ai was was basically machine learning. So this is kind of when uh, neural networks first came to be, and the first really successful, uh, the first really successful application of, of uh, neural networks were, were was when they were invented, and they were called perceptrons back then. And perceptron is like a very basic kind of neural network. It has some limitations that we're not going to get into, but um, but it was able to do like very very primitive image classification. So like in 1950, uh, 1958. The uh, U.S. Navy had um, basically installed an image classification system, which had something like uh, 400 cadmium sulfide photocells that would, would uh, like, you know, read the light, lighting conditions, and they could recognize like battleships in the sea or something like that. And uh, when when the public found out about this, it completely lost its mind, right? So this might already sound familiar, right? So the New York Times in 1958 wrote, new Navy device learns by doing. Psychologist shows embryo of computer designed to read and grow wiser. The Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. So I'm just showing you that because if you think that like AI hype is like a new thing, it's like, no way, this near, New York Times, like, the, what does it even mean, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence? It's like outrageous, you know, 1958, New York Times. And, um, and, and, and if you know a little bit about your like pop culture history, like the 19, late 50s, you know, when, when AI first became a field, inspired so much of the pop culture and especially like science fiction that would come to dominate the 1960s. So if you think about the things that were in the 1960s, it, it was kind of like, like for example, this is from a Space Odyssey, 2001 Space Odyssey, and cartoons like the Jetsons. Anybody watch the Jetsons? You know, they were like super hyper techno utopian. It was like, oh my God, we're gonna, because even Marvin Minsky, who was, you know, one of the fathers of AI, said, oh, oh yeah, we're gonna have human level intelligence by 1970. It's like, no problem. And, and so there was, uh, so humanity was like, oh my God, we're, we're going we're gonna to have robots ever walking around doing all our dishes and, you know, we're going to have flying cars and all this stuff. So it was like a really, really hyper optimistic period. And uh, which was, I think, spurred on by all of the hype of those early days. And um, the, the funny thing is, though, that like, you know, the, the conceptions that they had of the future tend to really reflect the present more than the past. And I, I often like to show this, this is, um, a cart, like some of the, there was a French, um, uh, what's the name, Vildemar, I forgot the first name, Vildemar, French um, like literary figure, maybe cartoonist, something, I can't remember what he did, but basically you can find these online, um, where he drew depictions of the year 2000, and he was living in the year 1910, and so he predicted the internet, he said you'll be able to send mail just by dictating it into a loudspeaker. But how did that work? Well, you dictate it into a gram gram like a gramophone, and then it would go down some like mega like 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 <laughs> mega long uh, vacuum tube, basically like the whole distance of the Earth. And so this kind of shows you that like whenever we're predicting the future, we're really kind of like indicating more of the present than we than we seem to think. 
Um, and that was kind of like, that was also with the Jetsons. It was like the coolest thing in the Jetsons was that they had like uh, very, very like, like advanced robots, right? But they didn't have an internet, anything like that. So, um, but that was really the 60s, you know, a lot of optimism, a lot of uh, excitement. And then that gave way to the 1970s and 80s, which became like much more dystopian. So like this is, uh, this is from Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, which was uh, where, where the AIs were these like, kind of like uh, a lot more dystopian, you could say, uh, had a much more dystopian view of, of society. And a lot of that was because what happened was that the press kind of ran out of patience. You know, they were like, you promised us, you know, hard AI by 1970. And, and it turned out that the problem was a lot more difficult to solve than we initially imagined. And so the, um, the end result was a lot of disappointment. And this led to something that machine learning researchers and AI uh, researchers call, uh, con call the AI winter. Uh, it's very dramatic, right? And, and what the AI winter was, was it was a period, a long period of reduced uh, like pop culture interest or, or popular interest in the subject because people kind of were like, okay, this is, you know, this isn't really what we thought it was. And it became a very academic topic over the next few decades. So it really wasn't part of the popular press. Um, nevertheless, though, a lot of important, um, important advancements occurred during this period in academia and the field of machine learning was born properly in the, in the 1980s. Uh, and, and machine learning kind of took inspiration from the, those early perceptrons, but also brought in a lot more thinking from probability and statistics than, than was otherwise part of the field. Um, the field had really been dominated by expert systems uh, up, until, up, until the, uh, up until machine learning kind of started to put a dent in the field. And, um, and then deep learning is kind of like, and I'll introduce deep learning in just a second, but deep learning kind of takes that to the next level, um, learning from data. And um, so after the AI winter gave, gave in, we're now living in what many people consider like a second golden age, like something like the 1960s, were, um, which is a lot of optimism, uh, a lot of uh, popular interest, uh, huge popular interest, right? So, and, and, I, and it's, it's really crazy. It's been really crazy for me to watch actually because, um, you know, like, okay, like for example, a few weeks ago, um, the CEO of Google, um, Sundar Pichai, said that AI, he said something like AI is more important than fire or electricity. That's not, that's a, that's a direct quote. And then also Justin Timberlake, his last music video was, uh, t takes place at a deep learning conference in, the, in 2036 or something like that. So you know we've reached peak hype, you know, when you see things like that happening. And you also know we've reached peak hype because uh, because of the amount of investment that's gone into AI. You can see that it, it's sort of like is outstripping VR also. Uh, and, and if you look at how much more investment, this is mostly like commercial investment, venture capital, um, into AI. This is, this is already not, not out of date, and this, was, this is incomplete. We're probably like over here by now. Um, the, the field has gr like probably 10 times more money in the field than there was just a few years ago. And that has created a huge ecosystem uh, within many, many sort of applied disciplines uh, that didn't used to exist before, right? So like, um, so did this class is a good example, right? So I, I became, when I took, when I took machine learning uh, in college, it was just, there was like one machine learning class in college. It was a computer science class basically, and there was like 20 people in it. And now the, these classes, some of them are up like the entry level uh, machine learning classes are, are up in enrollment by like 600%. And not only that, but there's also things like this, right? Which is, we're not a computer science department. We're not, we're not proper, properly engineers, right? But yet we're learning about machine learning because it's become relevant to all of these other things. And so I wouldn't have ever imagined 10 years ago that I'd be, that I would be like, you know, teaching machine learning in the course because there just didn't seem to be that kind of ecosystem to support it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a lot has changed and there's a lot more interest. A big part of that has also been that a lot of the materials are now accessible to people from outside of universities. Um, and actually that's one of, in the next couple of slides, I have, I have some information about that also. There's online courses. Um, there, a lot of this stuff is being put online. So that has, that's a really big, big change from the last few years. Deep learning, which I'll introduce later, um, what, what that means exactly has a lot of huge applications that didn't used to exist. So one of the, the biggest that everyone kind of knows about is, um, these, I would say these are kind of the three categories of, re of really, really prominent applications. One is computer vision. So uh, things like self-driving cars 
or uh, industrial robots, they all use computer vision to kind of know what's going on around them. And, um, and, and we, we've gotten to the point where there's a very, very reasonable expectation that we're going to have fully autonomous vehicles like sometime within the next, you know, who knows, like estimates vary, but, but like it, 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 it's already on public roads. So that's, that's a big change. There was, a, there was not really much feeling that that would be like possible even uh, up until fairly recently. Uh, there's a lot of like also speech uh, applications, uh, or sorry, not just speech, but like sound more generally. So most of the speech, well, I shouldn't say most, all of the speech to text systems that you interact with, so your your Siri's and your Cortana's and your Alexas and whoever, are using uh, neural networks, deep neural networks, to uh, decode your speech into text so that it understands what you're saying, um, and then it uses more deep learning to then process that and actually try to you know, gain meaning from it. There's also like an exploding, um, uh, exploding industry uh, with applying AI to like basically the medical field. So things like medical diagnostics that can be done on smartphones, all of that has like potentially may radically change the way that we, uh, the way that we go about like, like basically health applications. So all of that is um, because, you know, a lot of these things actually do a better job than doctors now. So. Um, or not, not to say that we're not, we're getting rid of doctors, but like doctors may be using more and more of these sort of like uh, advanced diagnostic tools to help them kind of understand their patients and things like that. Um, there is also really an amazing community that's formed around deep learning and I've been really, really pleased to like become a part of it. Like for me, I never really um, like, again, like two, 2000, let's say 10 years ago, uh, you had to be a PhD student in the computer science department to be doing to be part of some sort of a deep learning community. All of the papers, like the publications, the software, it was all proprietary. It was in pay paywall journals. It was um, in software that had very expensive licenses. A lot of that has changed. So the, mach the machine learning field in, is and is actually quite a leader in this regard among the field, like among the other sciences. So, like for example, this isn't true of the life sciences yet that most of the publishing is being done in open access, uh, in open access journals. So all machine learning stuff is done open access. It's frequently published in advance of conferences and journals. So a lot of that stuff is just kind of like, they have a little bit of an ITP spirit. You know, they're like, they're like prototyping and, it, and showing stuff before it's ready. Um, and, and that has really, I think, been a big part of why it has spilled over into popular culture. Not just because the, the field is so advanced, but also because it's doing a better job kind of like uh, tying in most um, other, other, uh, you know, other disciplines into it. Yeah? Is there anyone in particular, any like driving force behind that or any, why is it? Uh, it's, well, you know, we could, I mean, there's, I have my, cyn I have certain cynical reasons for it. Uh, one, one thing about it is that like a lot of the publishing, uh, publishing both papers and code is open access because there's a far less of, a, of an incentive to hide it than there used to be because before you would hide, you would make software closed source because there's some sort of, there's a competitive advantage to having it proprietary. But now um, software is, is kind of actually a little bit cheap. It's, it, it, or it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than it used to be. And really the big, the big thing is data. Uh, you know, so uh, Google can publish all of their methods uh, for you, but but you can't really replicate them unless you have access to that kind of data. Um, but, but also there's, there's a little bit of like, um, there, there's also like a cultural uh, shift that like, so one, one thing that happened, I think recently was all, uh, a lot of the t tech companies, maybe it's just, maybe this might just be like Google or Facebook or I don't, I don't remember, but, uh, but they officially have lifted the um, requirement that someone has to have even a college degree to be on these uh, on their engineering teams, you know, there's really kind of this like um, cultural shift that like credentials aren't what's important. It's what's important is you know what you're doing. Um, so there's a lot, you know, you see a lot of like very prominent figures in the field that, that are actually like either either very young or or, um, or kind of ha had an unconventional path to getting there. And that's that's I think, yeah, it's hard to say what which came first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, but but like that's definitely. They're definitely mutually reinforcing, I would say. Um, another thing that is like, okay, besides for open access publishing, there's also these frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Again, we'll be talking about them in more detail later in the course, but they have really, really greatly um, 
made it made the field much more accessible from a practical implementation standpoint. So we have access to a lot of the same open source tools that the researchers themselves do. And a lot of the um, like a, a lot of times when when a paper comes out that's demonstrating some incredible new thing, it comes with open source code. So that's put on GitHub that anyone can can actually just like copy and use. Now, it's not to say that it's necessarily easy to use. A lot of times it requires a lot of expensive hardware. So it's not like perfectly accessible, but it's definitely um, it's definitely a lot more accessible than it used to be. For me, when I was getting started with machine learning, you had to use MATLAB. Um, and you had to have a lot of domain knowledge to apply machine learning within a particular uh, domain. Um, and actually, I have a, when, when, we, when we define what deep learning is, I'll, I'll explain what, what I mean by that just uh, in, in more detail. Um, things like Kaggle are also quite interesting. So like you can be basically a freelance data scientist. So companies will post uh, tasks that they need to be solved, you know, data science, science tasks, and they just put a bounty on them. And then anyone can submit a, um, a solution to that problem and get paid for it. So that's pretty interesting. And that, and that really like is changing a lot of the nature of, of jobs. Like, you know, you don't necessarily have to the, the bounds of a company are, are, are much more, um, well, a little bit more porous, right? Because people are, first of all, a lot of people work on open source software, like basically full time. And so what organization do they belong to? You know, they might be being paid by multiple organizations or they may not be in any at all. So there's kind of a lot more of a sort of porous um, uh, boundaries between companies and, and people. And, and I think that's like, a, that's actually an interesting, like a progressive thing. Um, and then a lot of it is, you know, discussion online. So like Twitter and Reddit and, and all of these have, have really, um, they have, a, there's a lot of commentary about machine learning and new papers that is just constantly flowing through these platforms. And so it's not just like you have to talk, you only see the people in your field at conferences, people have a constant dialogue and then anyone can join in principle anyway. Um, so that's kind of like, that's all made it possible to be really be a part of this field, um, which is I think quite interesting. Um, let's just see how we're doing, 1018, okay. Um, we'll go into like, let's say 1030 and then we'll take a short break, uh, something like that. Um, so computer vision, I definitely have way too many slides, so we're gonna have to, <laughs> well, we're gonna have to kind of figure things out um, as we go. So um, machine learning before deep learning, so uh, it was characterized by a lot of sort of handcrafted feature extraction. So let's say you want, you're interested in image classification, and you wanted to figure out that this is a cat, you know. Um, the way that that would normally be done is that you had a bag of tricks that you would use that came from computer vision. So extracting edges, extracting uh, hog and har cascades, hog features. Hog stands for histogram of oriented gradients. So it's kind of like the main direction that the sort of pixels go. And then, you know, you generate a histogram of that. And that gives you a representation of the data, which is much more compact than just all of the pixels, right? And then you would apply some shallow learning algorithm and get a label. Um, now, this, if this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, like it will make more sense when we introduce neural networks. Um, but the, this is kind of the way that computer vision was done for a long time. And, the, and of course, it's like, it's, it's pretty decent. It works, you know, like pretty well. Um, so, and it's efficient too. You could do it on small computers, right? Um, however, it's expensive, time consuming, because you know you would have to experiment with many different kinds of features, and you know they'd be implemented all across the board in lots of different frameworks that were mutually incompatible with each other. So there would be just a lot of engineering that went into it, and also uh, oh this should be red, not 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 green. <laughs> um, also the like I said yeah the, the code would be non homogeneous in the sense that like hog, har cascades, sift these are all like different computer vision features that all have different implementations. And so it would be very hard to keep track of all this stuff and be good at all of it. Um, and, uh, and also like it was very, everything was very task specific. So like if you are interested in image classification, you may use some features. And then if you're interested in uh, object detection, which is some other task that we'll introduce later, then maybe you'd use different features for that because they worked better. So all of this made, made it like a very heavily engineering oriented field. Um, now the difference, and this is kind of what deep learning is all about. So this is machine learning, like deep learning. Deep learning has basically set, has basically absorbed the um, the the task of 
of a feature extraction and placed it into the, uh, the, the, the actual machine learning pipeline itself. Um, it's trained end to end, which mean, and what that means is that uh, f the features that are useful for the task are actually figured out in the process of training. And when we talk about training neural networks, that will make more sense. Uh, the, now the whole system is very holistic and very homogenous. So it's kind of like, you know, what works internally here, it's very homogenous. It's like, and you'll see when we introduce neural networks that all neural networks are is very simple operations, but on a massive scale. Um, so additions, multiplications, and max operations, except 100 million of them, right? And, and that is, that can be very hard in the computer, but it's very easy on our brains because it's kind of easy to understand it from, there's not necessarily so many different kinds of moving parts. Um, the problem with deep learning is that it's extremely data hungry. And the reason why it works is because we're living in this age where, where you know, the amount of data that we create has exploded. And so this kind of stuff wasn't practical 10 years ago because we just, no one had access to this kind of data. Um, now, uh, some of us have access to this kind of data, not all of us, uh, that's also changing. But, but in, in principle, like that is a big part of why a lot of this works. Deep learning has been technically around for 30 years. Um, there's lot, neural, it's, it's, in some ways, it's just neural networks, but um, they never used to work. And a big part of the reason, or at least they never used to work very well. And the big part of the reason why that's true is that um, it, it's simply because it didn't have, we didn't have data. That's all. Like a lot of this stuff needs data to scale. Um, and so, and, and also it's more expensive now because it requires so much computation. Um, and you know, so pros and cons, but, uh, we're, but definitely deep learning is kind of dominating the field right now. There's kind of three types of machine learning um, that, that you could say, and we're, we're gonna mostly focus on the top two ones. Uh, and then maybe we'll have like one session later on um, in the semester on reinforcement learning. And this is the basic breakdown. Supervised learning means you're dealing with data that has labels, right? So, um, you know, you have a data set that's like, you know, atmospheric conditions of days. And then the label is how much did it rain, right? And then the question is, can you predict how much it's gonna rain? So more or less supervised learning is concerned with prediction to be able to model a relationship between two dependent variables. Um, and, and the goal of supervised learning is to, is to discover the relationship between those variables and model it. Um, unsupervised learning means that you just have data and no labels. So let's say you have a huge amount of images um, and you, you, what, what, can, well, what can you do with that, right? So you're not necessarily interested in prediction so much as you are interested in understanding the sort of latent characteristics of that data, sort of trying to form a representation which gives you insights about that data. It's a little bit more elusive, like a little bit harder to understand exactly how, what unsupervised learning is. And, and to some people, like unsupervised learning is like, you might consider it almost useless. <laughs> Like, but that actually has a lot of really interesting applications. One of the most interesting applications that, and the one that's gonna be a big part of the class is generative models. Generative models are essentially unsupervised learning, um, uh, unsupervised learning routines. Um, that's not 100% true. There's, there is actually a lot of like interplay between these two things. And you might say that unsupervised learning is like a part of supervised learning. Um, we'll, we'll see these things in more, more specifics later on. Um, but, but generative models are definitely like one of the big, big interests in unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning is, is in some sense, it's the final frontier as I, as you might say, it's kind of like, um, uh, so, well, first of all, like the basic idea of reinforcement learning is that you have agents that are interacting with environments and seeking rewards, right? So basically you can think of games in this way, right? It, you know, you have a protagonist within a game, it's interacting with an environment and interacting means that it has an effect on the environment. And that's fundamentally different from supervised and unsupervised learning, which is kind of much more static in the sense that you have a sort of like constrained, uh, like non-changing, you know, you're just learning a function, right? And it, there's no, there's no sense of an environment. And most AGI research is a concern with reinforcement learning. AGI stands for artificial general intelligence. AGI just means what artificial intelligence used to mean. Uh, artificial intelligence used to mean like, you know, uh, like true AI, like computers that could think like human beings, right? And, uh, but eventually AI became, you know, used for everything. It like almost means the whole field. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that. And so researchers kind of use AGI, artificial general intelligence, as a sort of 
like um, to mean like cognitively like performant uh, like um, you know AI uh, algorithms and then uh, reinforcement learning kind of makes use of supervised and unsupervised learning and so we'll, we'll have some stuff about this but it's a relatively advanced topic and I, I myself don't have a ton of expertise in it like I have some exposure to it so we'll probably like maybe do like a basic introduction to it but may, we may not get super far into it um, okay so let's introduce uh, let's just see how we're doing in time. Um, let me go like another five minutes and I'll take a quick break. Um, I'll introduce, actually, let's, let's actually take a break right now. I think this will be a good time. So like, let's take five and then I'll come back and introduce supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, so first of all, like, you know how I said about how, like, I was hoping to, that, that we'd be done by 11. That's like, we're not happening. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Like, <laughs> maybe because, well, yeah. Uh, it, we're, we're early, but, but it's like, it's, it's, we didn't start really the slides until like 20 minutes ago, right? Because we had this, like the logistics is kind of takes a while. And then some of the slides we're going to go through like bang, bang. Um, but we're going to, we're going to like, so, some of the stuff I might go through like quick, just because like we'll be having entire lectures about some of this stuff later so it's not necessary to necessarily give too much information about it right now this is really like to give you as broad of an overview as possible i i think we should still uh, end early but um but probably just like not that early um so sorry about that um no that's okay um okay so let's kind of define supervised learning and then i'm going to show you basically a bunch of applications like what is supervised learning learning used for right now um, now, first of all, before we understand supervised learning, we want to we want to kind of review the concept of like a function and fitting a function, right? So, for something like let's say logistic regression, what is logistic regression? Let's say you have a, a, a like a set of, a variable we call x, which is a vector that has a bunch of numbers, and those numbers are observations about something, right? So this this can mean an image, right? So x one, x two, those can all be pixels. They might be uh, columns of a data set that describe uh, you know a particular point uh, it can be observations about uh, about virtually anything right and the idea is that if you have a line like a, a line which is a uh, a function of those elements then you have a whole bunch of parameters that have to be fit right so a line like let's say in one dimension a line is what y equals mx plus b right everyone kind of learns that in grade school you know, you, that M is your y-intercept and B is your slope. And the principal observation is that depending on how we set M and B, then the shape of that function changes and therefore uh, what it represents changes, right? And the idea is that in, we want to be able to fit a function, which is to say we want to be able to find a value for each of its parameters, these coefficients, the W's here, that uh, fit a particularly uh, fit a function that we need, right? And um, so, like, f now we'll be doing most in, in mostly we'll be doing this in the computer vision context. We'll, we'll we'll be working with images, and an image, right, is nothing but a set of pixels. So to you you can see that this is a nine, right? But all the computer sees is that it's just a whole bunch of numbers that correspond to its pixels. And so, if we are to work with an image as a data point, we decompose it into a set of pixel values. So if this, is, this image happens to be 784 pixels, and so it's a 784 dimensional vector, which can be the input to a line, right? And um, so this is the, the basic diagram that describes what supervised machine learning is. We have a function, and, and let's just assume for, for just a moment that the, our function is nothing but a line. Like it's a multi-dimensional line, right? So like a two-dimensional, a line with two variables, uh, like where there's x1 and x2 is a plane, right? A line with three variables is now a, three, a hyperplane. It's like a three-dimensional structure. Um, we're going we're gonna to be talking a lot about this hypergeometry stuff, which is like, which will probably like, it still blows my mind when I think about it, but um, it, 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 the, the secret is that it, it basically things in 20D are the same as they are in 2D. And so you just kind of get used to thinking about things in 2 or 3D and then just extrapolate. Uh, but in any case, like imagine you have a sort of like a, a line, it has a, uh, or, or some function, it has a whole bunch of parameters and we have training data. And our training data is a set of observations that pair X and Y. 
Okay, so just for example, let's suppose X is a bunch, X refers to an image. And so it's the pixels of the image. And then Y is a label. So Y is cat, dog, whatever, right? And we have a data set that, that has a whole bunch of these pairs, like known pairs. We have images of cats, we have images of dogs, and so on. Then uh, the idea is that we have a function f, which we would like to map x to y accurately. So that when you run, uh, when you run uh, x through f, it gives you the correct answer every time. And uh, the, way that you, the way that you would do this in supervised learning is to, uh, is to have the training data, is to combine the learning, al is to use a learning algorithm with a whole bunch of training data to figure out what those free parameters should be. So if you had a line y equals mx plus b, figure out what it means means what is, what is m and b, right? And if you have uh, 784 dimensions, as you have here, then you have a lot more than just one, uh, one slope variable. You have 784 of them. That's just for a logistic regression. Um, and, and I'm actually going to show you, I'm, I'm going to do this in, if, if some of this is flying by you, don't worry, because the whole point of tomorrow's lecture is going to be to do this slower, to like describe what this is. I'm just giving you like like a, like the an overview, so don't worry too much if it's yeah. So um, just my understanding of, of, of AI or at least machine learning was always that um, uh, if you have like basically a bunch of questions and you know what the answers are, you can uh, pair them together and you sort of let machine learning kind of sort out the exact sort of uh, like way to, to answer those questions, and then mm -hmm. at some point you come up with a new question and using the Sure. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's fine. As good as any, right? So, like, your questions are, what y is is this x? Uh, and then, yeah, if you have a training set, you can figure out the relationship. And then, when you get no unknown examples of x, then you can th run them through f and be reasonably confident that that the y that it's giving you is accurate. So yeah. Um, now, uh, like looking at this a little bit, so going from here to here, the way that we generally do this is let's say in the, in, with image classification, you, we have a data set of, let's say, handwritten digits. And we want to be able to develop an algorithm which will tell us what digit this image corresponds to. So we want to be able to convert this nine into a label that says this is a nine. And so we have a whole set of these x, y observations. X is the pixels, y is the digit category. And then the, the sort of family of algorithms that is dominant within machine learning is basically uh, gradient descent. And I'm going to describe gradient descent tomorrow in more detail. So don't worry about that too much right now. There's other kinds, but basically flavors of gradient descent, descent are dominating today. Um, so like, let's talk about applications. Like what is this whole, what can we do with this mapping, right? What, what is it for? So the most basic one is image classification, right? We get a picture of something. We have a whole bunch of possible labels. Let's say there's three, cat, dog, and piano. And we want this, we want F to tell us that this is a dog. And when we receive an image of a piano, we want it to light up for piano, right? And, uh, and so the idea is that if we have a whole data set of these images of each of these categories, we can tune the, in, the inside of this function so that it gives us the correct answer when we project an image of a dog through it or whatever else. So that's image classification and, and just classification in general. Classification means you have a set of classes, discrete, right? They're not continuous. It's just like a set of discrete labels and you want to figure out this is an X, Y, or a, or a Z, right? And, and that can be as many as a thousand categories, like in the case of ImageNet, but it can be just as much as, you know, it could just be two. Uh, regression in general, the way that regression is distinguished from classification is that instead of having discrete categorical variables, we have a continuous value that we're trying to figure out. So for example, like maybe you want uh, a machine learning algorithm to, to, to take a picture of a, of a street and tell us how many inches of snow are on the street, right? It's a silly example, but, but basically it gets the point across. Um, and actually it is an interesting example. Maybe, um, maybe people are doing that. And, and now the number of inches of snow is continuous, right? It's, you can have two inches, you can have 2.1 inches. There's a cardinality to that number. 
right? Whereas dog, cat, and so on, it's not like there's there's no continuity between the classes. Um, so that's that's the distinction between regression and um, uh, and um, uh, classification. Um, okay, text classification. So uh, what I'm going to do the next few slides are just to give you uh, like a a general feel for how well a feel for just how general this f is right so you know if you if you really want to look at it from the most from the bird's eye view f is like a mapping machine you know it takes some kind of input as long as it can be structured as a data vector and it gives you some kind of output right so we're modeling relationships between between things so this is just a whole bunch of examples of that and, and ones that we'll probably be working with right so one very important one that is uh, of great interest to many is text classification. So an example of text classification is sentiment analysis. That means taking a sentence or something that somebody wrote and then trying to classify its sentiment, right? So this is a classification problem, but instead of having an image, you have a, uh, uh, like a sentence. Uh, and so this function maps this sentence, the service was the absolute worst, blah, 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 to the emotion angry, right? Um, now, when you first look at this com and compare it to the image classification example, this may not, this may be confusing at first because you think like, how can this be a vector, right? It's like uh, an unbounded number of words, right? What we'll talk about this later when we when we get into more natural language processing stuff. We'll talk about exactly how that works, but there are ways of pr uh, of taking paragraphs or text or sentences and projecting them into a vector of fixed length, right? And we'll talk about how to do that later. Um, it's, but it's, it's kind of like, um, well, yeah, it's a bit beyond the scope of today, but the point is that this can be represented as a, um, of, of like a fixed length vector, just the way that the image, image can be. Uh, there are ways of doing that. We'll actually look at them later in the, in the course. Um, so text classification, sound classification. So speech to text is, um, well, it's not sound classification exa exactly. It might be more like sound detection, but uh, and we'll talk about the distinction between detection and, and classification. But basically, this is speech to text, right? So you get some audio waveform and you figure out that it's that someone's saying hello there, right? So that's speech to text or, or sound classification. Um, other image, uh, other things you can do with images, figure out uh, where they are, their bounding boxes, right? So this is called localization, and it can be combined with classification. Um, there's also object detection. So the difference, the 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 um, the dif difference, the distinction between classification and detection is that classification says this image is one thing, whereas object detection says says there is a possibly infinite set of things that are inside this image and we're detecting them. So this image has a dog, a bicycle, and a truck. So that's what the difference between object detection and image classification is. Um, pose detection. This, uh, this, by the way, this visual is confusing because it's identical on the left and right. I just couldn't find the input video. So imagine like the, on the left side, the skeletons aren't actually here. Um, so the point is taking an image and then fitting skeletons to it, right? Um, this is like, so uh, closely related to, uh, object detection is, uh, or sorry, uh, pose detection is like as a dent, this repository called dense pose, which actually gives you much more than a skeleton, but it gives you a whole, uh, sort of mesh corresponding to the, to the body, which is, um, which is super useful. We'll be using this later. Um, semantic segmentation. So this is segmenting an image into its, con its constituent parts. Semantic means that it's labeled according to the object category. So that's why, for example, um, all three of these things are red because it's like the, the, it probably corresponds to the closet or something. So the objects of the same class have the same color. Yeah, that's why all the pillows are yellow, for example. Um, other things you can do that are image operations, colorization. Right? Take a black and white image and turn it into a color image. This is an example of an, uh, th the last two examples are actually examples of image to image. So this is kind of interesting because usually when you learn about machine learning and you learn this whole X to Y thing, we, th we, th we tend to think of it in very limiting terms, like Y is a label or Y is a, um, or Y is a continuous variable. But the thing is that Y can be a whole other image, 
It could be it could be anything, right? The point is that as long as it can be structured as some sort of a fixed length vector, then um, we can and we have a training set of those of those relationships. We can learn a mapping between any arbitrary x and y, and that makes machine learning very powerful. And it's very useful for us to think of it in much more general terms, you know, rather than boxing our boxing ourselves into a kind of like classification regression scenario. Um, style transfer is also a, a um, an example of an image to image operation. Will be uh, one of the lectures later um, when we talk about optimization based pixel art kind of stuff. We'll talk about style transfer. Um, super resolution. So this is really crazy. There's some research from 2017, I think, that basically deblurred images. Right? Deblurring is is super resolution. That means taking low resolution uh, images with very few pixels and figuring out what pixels are missing. So and and just like black and black and white to colorization, this is kind of like taking a small amount of information and extrapolating it to to the original amount of information that it had, which is kind of interesting. Like we can recover lost information. Uh, which means, by the way, that if you are using blurring to anonymize things, to anonymize people in your um, images, uh, consider blacking it out instead, because it turns out that we can see right through your blur. Um, um, image to text, right? So this is um, like, and th this this may look at first like uh, classification, but it's actually instead of classification, we have a whole sentence. It's producing a string that describes the image. So a group of giraffes standing next to each other, right? We have a neural network or something, or a learning algorithm, or a, um, a model which takes this image and figures out that there's a group of giraffes standing next to each other. So image to text. Text to image, you might have seen this. Uh, Chris posted this a few weeks ago and it went viral. It's basically like, um, a, a, uh, like this is a, a type of model called an attention GAN. We'll talk about those like technical terms later in the semester. But this takes a sentence that you write and then produces an image, right? It's backwards. It's from instead of image to text, it's text to image. So now it doesn't, it looks, it makes pretty wild looking things. You know, it's not necessarily like, it's in primitive days, right? It doesn't make the most, um, most realistic looking thing that you can imagine. Um, a woman eating, eating a delicious sandwich, right? But it's, well, it's pretty cool, right? Like you see a lot of weird looking artifacts here. Um, image to sound. So this is kind of neat, like, um, you know, well, this would be like, um, uh, like okay, there, there, there's kind of maybe two categories of this. One would be a retrieval. So like, it, it's basically a classification. Like maybe there's a set of sounds that you associate, like you have, this is beach sounds or something like that. Um, and there can also be generative applications. And there's, this is actually, here's a nice example of that. So this is made by this uh, fellow, Nao Tuki. And he does uh, sound classification, basically uh, retrieving sounds that are relevant to the image. sense, right? This is my favorite. <laughs> um, okay, speech to text. So transcription, I think I already had that, didn't I? Uh, might, this might be a duplicate slide. Um, text to sound. So, uh, so like, for example, um, you know, actually, like, Google, so Google, for example, it, it's now using um, like uh, completely synthesized uh, speech in most of its like uh, products that, that, that have some that talk to you basically. Um, so you say you know and actually your, your computers can do this too like you write say hello world and it, you know you get this robotic voice that says hello world. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in this as well. When we talk about wave nets later we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail. Um, we might do a section later in the in the semester on recurrent neural networks, which are we're mostly going to not focus on recurrent neural networks, but we might uh, maybe do one lecture about them depending on how much time we have. Recurrent neural networks are basically have a concept of time and sequence, so um, you can you can use them to train uh, like arbitrary arbitrary length sequences of things. So, for example, like um, 
uh, if you like, maybe a lot of you have seen uh, people doing this char RNN stuff, right? This is like um, text bots that generate, you know, strings that look like they came from the Bible or came from, you know, like uh, were by a famous author or something like that. Um, these are using recurrent neural networks, which predict one character at a time. And in general, these allow uh, these are very expressive. They allow us to kind of like, and, and they allow us to work with time. That's kind of. Uh, again, like we won't talk about that so much today. But one um, one application of recurrent neural networks is that you can do uh, sequence to sequence. So instead of like um, instead of having an image, you have maybe a sequence of images, like a video, or maybe uh, you have a sequence of words or something like that. So this is how language translation works. Language translation is basically a sequence to sequence problem. So translating German to English. Is um, is inherently a sequence, a problem of sequences. So um, that's one application of sequence to sequences. Now, um, so what is this F, right? Like we've been looking at these, this sort of black box that converts one type of data to another. Um, in in practice, we're going to be almost exclusively working with neural networks, right? And um, I'm not going to describe how neural networks work in too much detail today because we're going to spend all day tomorrow, like all of tomorrow's lecture is going to be dedicated to getting you to understand what these things are. Uh, but the way, at least like the way that you can think about it from the highest level perspective is that's it, that it's a, um, a graph which connects inputs to outputs through a series of layers where the information is going one way. So your x1, x2 is your input. So if your image is 784 pixels, then you would have 784 input neurons. And then each of these connections represent the, the, that value moving forward, and it's multiplied by some parameter, right? It's multiplied by a weight, right? So um, again, like we're gonna, we're gonna describe this in painstaking detail tomorrow, so I'm not gonna talk about it right now. Um, but in general, we're going to be using neural networks for almost everything that we do in this course. Um, a neural network that's set up for image classification might look like this, right? So this is a, a um, you know, an image of a two, and it will have ten output neurons which correspond to the um, digit label, and then the uh, goal is for it to give a high value for the correct label. So this is the two neuron, and so this is an image of a two, and it gives us a high activity in two gives us a small activity at three, but we can basically go, okay, two is the highest, so that's our answer. Um, and that's, and, and again, like we'll, we'll describe some of the properties of this tomorrow. Um, one thing to know about neural networks is that, like, and that will help inform almost the rest of today's lecture, is that they give us representations, right? They, they give us a sort of um, a representation of a data set which tells us what are the sort of meaningful features of the data set. And by features, I mean patterns, right? So for example, in this one layer neural network, the patterns that it learns are sort of archetypes of the image categories themselves, like the digits. There's a three, there's a four. And in general, um, these things give us um, like the dominant patterns within the particular data set. Right? Um, uh -oh. Computer's freaking out at me. Oh, there we go. Oops, hang on. Yeah, um, we'll talk about, like we'll introduce convolutional networks tomorrow, which which take this to the sort of next level, and they give us. Um, well, okay, I'm gonna skip the slide because it won't make sense right now, but but t tomorrow we'll talk about what these are. Um, okay, some applications of neural networks and uh, or in general supervised learning. So usually when you think of machine learning, you you're mostly concerned with the. Um, like, okay, well, usually when you introduce machine learning, we introduce classification and regression. And, um, and most people don't necessarily focus too much on this idea of learning a representation. But this is actually, um, it, it, this is sort of the, you know, classification and regression are the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg is the representation that you form of a data set. If you train a neural network in such a way that it forms a representation that knows what the patterns of that data set are, you can open up a whole new class of applications that are, that are going to be useful for many of the things that we do. So for, for example, reverse image search. So what is reverse image search? It's kind of like when you go on Google Images and you search with another image and it gives you images that are similar to it, right? 
and not just similar in terms of like superficial characteristics like the color like the colors and the pixels but are similar in terms of their high level features right so this gives us if we put in the query of this frog it gives us back a whole bunch of other frogs right so that's um, this in general has to this only works once you have formed a representation of the data set which gives you the features of a frog right for example um, the high level features like the perceptually meaningful high level features that are useful for distinguishing frogs from non frogs right? um, this is the same thing except with zebras right now um, reverse image search is making use of a similarity calculation so reverse image search says we will take the query image and find its distance from every from it and every other image in our data set and then we'll retrieve the ones that have the lowest distance but knowing this distance between the images actually lets you do other sorts of information retrieval uh, tasks that are useful as well so for example um, if you uh, any anyone here familiar with the work by Mario Klingemann called X degrees of separation that he made for a couple of people this is basically like a, a really uh, Mario Klingemann I'll show some of his work later he worked with um, uh, the Culture Institute Google's Culture Institute to uh, on a large collection of museum images where they would find where they would let you pick two images from the museum and then draw a path between them which takes other things in the museum and kind of naturally connects them so like like okay this isn't the museum collection but let's say your endpoints are this vase and a motorcycle so how can you go from vase to motorcycle using images within your data set? And it's basically a, like, um, a graph theory problem, right? The graph is connecting all of these images to each other, and the vertices, like the distances between them, is basically the distance of their feature vectors. You know, the one that you, the, the, way, the same way we do reverse image search. I think week three or four, we're, we're, we're going to actually do this. So you'll, you'll see, like, in much more excruciating detail, let's say. Um, how it's my job to to um, to actually like um, frighten a few of you into dropping the course so other people can <laughs> can can take it in your place. Um, so in any case, like um, yeah, this is kind of like shortest path between images, and it's pretty is a pretty fun one as well. Um, there's a lot of cool data visualization applications we'll look at. We're gonna learn how to do TSNI. Uh, TSNI is a dimensionality reduction technique that lets you organize high dimensional data in a way that is like visually pleasing. So here you see that there's all these images and they've been organized according to similarity. They're really small, so it's a little hard to tell, but like for example, over here, there's a cluster of whales. So all of the whale images have been, have been uh, placed together and all of the monkeys are like over here. And uh, in general, this is a difficult problem, right? Because you have to assign every image uniquely to one tile here. And so you have to kind of like, uh, there needs to be an efficient way of, of, of finding what we call an embedding, right? These are all embedded into this 2D, 2D grid um, in such a way that like the, all of the neighboring points are similar to each other. That's kind of the goal. TSNI can be applied not just to images, but it can be applied to audio as well, or text or any other kind of data. So, for example, um, this is a audio TSNI. This is another application in, in uh, one of the when we when we have everyone download the ML for OFX collection, um, which will be uh, like probably not not this week, but like either next week or the week after. Um, I think probably next week actually. Uh, but we'll we'll actually do this. We'll actually use this application. So all of these are audio samples, and they're grouped together according to perceptual similarity. So that's a pretty neat um, thing that you can do. You can also do this with text. So this is a whole bunch of Wikipedia articles that have been grouped together according to their topical similarity. So like all of the Marxism, uh, there's like a Marxism cluster here somewhere. I can't, I can't see it at the moment actually. There's a socialism cluster um, and so on. So they've been kind of grouped according to like topical similarity. Like what are these articles about? Um, now, um, switching gears a little bit, like we're, I'm not actually sure how if we'll end up doing word vectors. This is word vectors. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have a lesson devoted to this, but it might be something that some people are interested in. And actually, ML5 has support for this, so so at the very least, I'll at least point you to it if you happen to be interested in it. But word vectors are representations of words where the words are embedded into some sort of a space that preserves the relationships between the words. So, for example, like 
if you put all the words into a 3D space, you'll see that the vector connecting king and queen is the same as the vector connecting man and woman, right? And there's a lot of all these like uh, pr preservation of grammatical relationships, so that makes word vectors actually quite interesting. Um, you can do analogies and things like that. Um, these are these are super interesting. I don't I don't know how deep we'll get into it, but but it's just kind of worth being aware of. Okay, so one of the big modules of this class is going to be interactive machine learning, right? So this is the interactive telecommunications program, after all. So uh, obviously, like people are interested in how these things can be used in a real time scenario. And to that end, we're going to be using some tools that let us do things in real time, including Runway and ML5 and, and Weckonator, possibly. And um, so, and, and something like image classification, you can do in real time, right? And I, I'll, I think maybe either tomorrow or next week, I'll give you a like bigger rundown. Uh, I think, well, probably next week actually, I'll probably give you a rundown of projects which have made use of this, um, like real-time image classification because it's a wellspring for uh, so many different kinds of projects right and 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 actually like most of the uh projects ended up being like applications of image classification in real time so if you can detect a coffee cup or a croissant in a camera stream at real time you can associate that with with actions that happen right you're we're interested in making interactive um experiences that are that where certain element certain behaviors are triggered by the presence of something in, in the camera, let's say, um, and so will be. This will be like one of the core applications that we that we do. Um, just to give you a sense of the landscape of interactive machine learning, I'll, I'll show you at least one or two projects that are kind of cool. I mentioned earlier that I'm working on this ML for Pi library. So the, to my collaborator on that is this guy Bjorn Carmen, who made this device called the Objectifier a couple of years ago. And what the objectifier is, is a tiny device that, that um, originally was actually doing this on, a, on like a computer off screen and just communicating over Wi-Fi. But the whole point is now that we can, we can possibly embed it into the device itself. And it's like a really basic image classifier. It's, got, it's a little device that has a camera in it. And you can train it on the fly to detect two different categories of images. It's binary. It happens to be binary. So for example, you can train it to recognize closed, closed fist, open fist. And then when, when it sees that you have made an open fist, it turns on the light. When it sees that you have made a closed fist, it turns, it turns off the light. Or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not actually sure. Um, but the point is that like, if you have a device like this that you can carry around and put, into, and put into things, you can make appliances that turn on or off uh, according to like, whether or not they detect some event happening. Right? So he has a video. You can look at this online. He has a video where, for example, uh, people will at attach one of these to a reading lamp, lamp. So when it sees somebody open a book, like sit down by the reading lamp and open a book, it, the light goes on. And when they close the book, the light goes off, right? Um, there's another a really funny one where he's in the wood shop and the guy is working with a, like a, 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 what is it, like a band saw, like an electric saw. And so the camera is looking at the guy's face and if he has his safety goggles on, the machine turns on. And if he has a safety goggles off, the machine turns off. Um, uh, so that's that's kind of like some you know neat interactive applications that we can create using this type of framework. And yeah, it should be pretty easy for us to do this um, later on because, um, like as I said, like we, we might be able to do this with Raspberry Pis, which means that um, which means that it'll be relatively easy to integrate into whatever Raspberry Pi stuff you happen to be already doing. Um, and, and that's really the goal is to like give you a, to make this stuff fit into the craft that you're already doing. Um, one of the applications that I developed with uh, my, uh, so I have a constant collaborator, Andreas Refsgaard, who made a lot of the open frameworks materials. And he and I made this thing um, about two years ago called Doodle Classifier, which lets you, which, which um, well, okay, so the main thing that it lets you do is like, um, identify categories of drawings. So for example, you, you train it to recognize arrows and stars. And so the camera goes on on top of it and detects the things that you draw. Um, and, and actually it doesn't necessarily have to be drawings. It could be, it could be like other people have done this with just objects, but, um, but the point is that you can, you can use this application that runs on the Mac and it communicates with o, over OSC. So you can pretty easily, like I'll train everybody how to use this later. I'll probably release a little tutorial. Um, and it will train, uh, it will be able to um, trigger different kinds of behaviors, right? So like if you have a drawing application, 
Um, I, I've seen like I've done all these workshops where people have used this in all sorts of ways. Like there's, there's just this one application. So for example, like I've had musicians use it. Like they'll cre like I had one group of uh, students who basically made like a sand pit, and then there's a camera on top of the sand pit, and and when they move their hands uh, around. Um, actually, this might not have been using Doodle Crossfire. It might have been using Covnet Crossfire, which is very similar. We'll, I'll show all of those things. But, but anyway, when they moved the sand around, it, it triggered uh, audio. Like they were playing Ableton Live, and it triggered the audio to do different things. So um, again, like imagine all sorts of cool, interesting, interactive scenarios. Um, so <laughs> this one's really cool. This is Lassie, uh, also from Denmark. He's playing Tetris with his face. So again, this is just image classification. Uh, well, actually, this is not image classification because he's using the face tracker. Um, but this is also like a tool that, that comes with a collection. And um, one of the things that we can do is we have, um, we have an application inside of, inside of the Open Frameworks collection that, let, that lets you control your keyboard, your keyboard and your mouse, actually. The, the mouse I'm not done yet, but the keyboard is definitely uh, useful. So if you have, if you, there's online games that you can play, you can you can set up an image classifier to control those online games. Right? So things like that. Um, and um, these are some of the tools that we'll be using for real time stuff. Uh, ML5 and P5 kind of go together, so we'll be looking at ML5 and it uses and it creates a lot of P5 sketches. Um, and then you know some stuff with open frameworks and processing. And then, uh, like I said, if you see Chris around, just like ask him when that when that beta <laughs> is coming around. And um, and then and then Wekinator as well. Um, and then also another thing, just to give you a sense of the landscape, there's another repository of JavaScript demos, ML4A demos, which, uh, for example, here I am playing Pong with my face. Right. So, um, I actually this game is really hard. Um, but in any case, like you can do this stuff in the browser as well. So set up an image classifier, uh, because all this was is an image classifier. Whenever it detects that my face is on this side, it presses the up key. Or, or actually, it, it just, there's no up key, but it makes the, makes the paddle go up, right? So classification, action, right? Kind of think of it in that framework. Um, okay, moving along. So another module in this class is going to be all about um, basically optimization-based pixel art. This is a little... Uh, it, it, the distinction between this and generative models is not going to make any is not going to be clear to you right now until we actually introduce them. But this is uh, this is actually very different from from generative models. It um, but in any case, like if you're familiar with Deep Dream, so how many people here know Deep Dream? Okay, that made a big splash a couple years ago. This is some work by the original creator of it, Alex Mordvinsev, who was at Google. Um, you can make all sorts of interesting um, inter uh, oh, not interactive. <laughs> That's the whole other last section. So you can make a whole uh, bunch of like really interesting graphics um, using neural networks in, in, within an optimization context. And optimization means we are figuring out the pixels which optimize some objective. And in the case of Deep Dream, the, opt the objective is to uh, am amplify all of, the, all of the things that the neural network sees, right? Enhance those things. Um, when we, I think week five, week four or five is going Something like that. Week four or five, we're gonna we're gonna introduce this, and we'll talk about what, more what that means. Um, as I said, I know I'm I'm probably introducing a lot of things that are that are like that I'm covering very superficially, um, but we're gonna be these are all the things that are gonna be part of the class. So mostly like if it looks interesting, uh, you're gonna learn exactly how it works. Um, I've been super interested in Deep Dream myself, like since it came out, and I've been kind of iterating on it, my, uh, iterating on it. There's a notebook in the ML for a collection which shows you how to do some advanced techniques for Deep Dream. So this is like combining um, different, so like, deep, well, again, like I, don't, I shouldn't go into it because we haven't introduced it properly, but, but making graphics like this, um, we're gonna learn how to do that, that kind of stuff. And it's very, very, very um, open-ended. So um, the aesthetics can actually change, it can vary quite a bit depending on what you do. I'm making videos as well, so things like this. Um, there's really a lot that you can you can do with this technique. Yeah. How long does it take to process each frame in this one? That one right there, uh, probably a long time. I, I can't remember exactly, just because uh, I, it can vary anywhere from like a few seconds to to like 15 minutes, let's say, depending on a lot of the settings. So there's actually a, like a big floor ceiling. Yeah. 
um, style optimization, right? So style, I, I, I introduced style transfer a few slides ago. So like style transfer is regenerating some image in the style of another image. So this is the Mona Lisa regenerated as though, as though they, uh, she was painted by Van Gogh, you know, while he was doing Starry Night. So um, we're gonna learn exactly how style transfer works. St uh, or the original, the original style transfer is actually very closely related to Deep Dream. Uh, in the sense that it's an optimization-based approach, it's not a generative model. Um, that was the original style transfer. I'm gonna, like when we introduce it, I'm gonna explain what all this math stuff is. We're not gonna do it right now. But um, style transfer now is, uh, is kind of used much more generically. So style transfer can be the result of a generative model or it can be using this, this approach. Um, we'll we'll deambiguate them when we introduce them. I think that'll probably be like, yeah, again, week five or six. Um, and I'm super, I've been working a lot with this idea of texture synthesis. So this is kind of like synthesizing new kinds of Google Maps. And then I actually, I messed up, this should be looping. So this is a perfect loop. Um, so, well, any, anyhow, um, texture synthesis is actually very closely related to, um, is very closely related to style transfer. It's actually basically the same, same software. Um, I'm also going to show you some work by other people that are exploring uh, exploring this technique as well. There's an artist in Berlin named Sofia Crespo who's been using this texture synthesis stuff in really, really crazy ways. <laughs> like, yeah, math teacher, I think something of that sort, uh, making a lot of really interesting art. And uh, style transfer can be done on videos. My, my uh, slides are becoming quite sluggish, so I might need to very quickly, oof. My mouse is hardly moving. I think I need to elevate my computer. It's a very old computer, and I, I'm dedicated to like not, not buying any any because I really don't this. Oh, I really <laughs> don't like these. Like, it's it needs air. So, <laughs> okay, let me introduce generative models. Um, so. Um, Generative models are fascinating, um, and they're going to be a really big part of the like the second half of the course. One of the more advanced things that we do, and the idea of a generative model, it kind of in, like you can. I just came up with this explanation kind of yesterday. Like it, it inverts feature extraction. So with feature extraction, it's like you take a whole bunch of images and you figure out what features they have. With generative models, we do it the other way around. We have some features that we desire, and we create images that have those features. So generative models are, if you've seen all of this stuff, that, that a lot of the stuff that has made this, this concept of machine learning for art very popular has been the result of generative models. So synthesizing new faces and synthesizing new um, like, uh, you know, emojis and synthesizing, like having neural networks hallucinate things, right? This is all the work of generative models. And in general, like the, like, um, the architecture of generative models is that it usually takes in some input vector which describes a set of features that you desire, and then it uh, converts it into an image. Generative models form a representation of data and then let you synthesize new examples that look as though they came from the original data, but didn't, right? Now there's kind of two categories of these, and I'm gonna uh, later, this will be already probably the second half of the course when we introduce these in more detail, but the, but the two that we'll, we'll kind of look at are uh, autoencoders and generative adversarial networks, right? Autoencoders are um, uh, basically try to uh, form a representation of a data set by, um, by doing a really, really funky thing, which is that they use a neural network to try to reconstruct the data through a bottleneck. So in other words, you make a neural network that takes in some images and then it goes through a series of layers where, which keep on making it smaller and smaller. So like the, the amount of information, it keeps on compressing it. And then it goes in the reverse, it goes bigger and bigger until it gets back out to this output. And the output, the goal of the output, the, uh, the objective that you're trading to is to actually reconstruct the original input. And um, again, this won't make too much sense right now without in, not in the context of all the stuff that we will we'll have to learn first. Um, it's a really, really strange thing, but basically like the, um, by training it in this way, we, uh, we create this, uh, this thing that is capable of taking arbitrary numbers into here and then projecting them out into an image, right? And that lets you generate samples of real images, right? They, and they come out characteristically very blurry inside of autoencoders. 
Um, there's another view of it, right? So you can kind of think of it as a neural network which is divided into two parts, an encoder and a decoder. The encoder takes the image and it compresses it into a small vector of perceptually meaningful high-level features, right? And we sometimes call this the latent space. So if you hear like people talking about you know, going through the latent space, things like that. You'll, you'll hear this a lot in the sort of creative AI world. Um, they're talking about this, right? This is a representation of the image within some low, relatively low dimensional um, space that contains all the images in it. And then you can take an arbitrary vector inside of the latent space and project it out through the decoder and it generates a new face, right? And autoencoders are compressing the information and then decompressing it. So that there's, it's a lossy process, right? That's why, that's why this, it, this loses some detail from, from this original one. Um, but nevertheless, it actually does um, capture a lot of, like, uh, a lot of useful information. Um, and, uh, and this may, turns out to be very useful for us. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's trained to do that, right? So like the weights, the, when it's trained, it figures out a set of weights that would do that accurately. Um, and, it's in, in, and it has to do it because, well, first of all, it's being trained to do that. So it's trying to maximize the fidelity that it has to the original data. Um, and so it's kind of incentivized to learn perceptually meaningful high level or, or high level features, like features that can describe as much of the original information as possible. It's, it's really actually quite similar to compression. And, and actually tomorrow I'll, I'll try to make an analogy to compression that, that, might, that might give you a little bit more insight into that. Um, a much more crazy uh, way of doing this is what's called a generative adversarial network. And again, like don't, uh, don't read these notes. It's like, it's not gonna make any, it's not gonna make any sense right now. We're gonna, this is, we're gonna introduce these later in the year. Um, but generative adversarial networks are very similar to autoencoders, except they kind of decouple the, gen the uh, encoder from the decoder in, um, in a really funky way. They, it's kind of like two neural networks which are trained adversarially. One neural network is trying to generate images and the other neural network is trying to tell apart the real ones from the fake ones. Real ones are, came from the original data and the fake ones came from the generator. And um, again, like this is sort of the high level architecture. It may not make a lot of sense to you right now. By the end of the year though, it will. That's my goal. Um, and, and we're also going to use these. So the, these create incredibly interesting uh, samples. Like, and, that's, and that's kind of the goal. Um, don't feel bad for not knowing, understanding too, bad, too much what generative adversarial networks are because they're really, really uh, astonishingly new. So they came, they, we invented them in 2014. They have what, like one person basically came up with the original concept, this, this uh, scientist named Ian Goodfellow. And uh, it wasn't until 2015 that we started seeing generative adversarial networks, or GANs, as, as we sometimes shorten them to, producing samples of images that looked realistic, right? And uh, this is from 2015 from a paper called Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Networks by Alec Radford and Samit Chintala and Luke Metz. And basically, this shows that th this model can be used not only to synthesize uh, fake faces, after having been trained on a data set of real faces, but it does so in a way that lets you do arithmetic in the latent space. And uh, again, like what that means is not uh, in detail, is not gonna make sense right now, but, um, but uh, it, just, just to get you excited, like you'll be able to perform arithmetic operations on the features of your, of your generative models. Like let's say you can take the vector which produces man with glasses and then subtract from it the latent vector which produces man and add the vector which produces woman and then you get man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses, right? That's kind of a really, really neat little trick. Um, we'll talk more about the properties of this latent space. It's actually very similar to the way that word vectors work also. They have these sort of arithmetic uh, capabilities. Um, now, more recently, this is what came, uh, this is the sorcery that came from NVIDIA uh, late, late last year. These are progressively grown GANs, which produce very high resolution, like 1,024 pixel versions of faces um, at not only very high resolution, but incredibly like detailed and realistic looking. I mean, I know they're kind of weird looking, but, but it's just, it's still mind blowing that we can do this. 
Uh, unfortunately, this repository is very expensive. It's, 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 it's uh, available online, so you can actually use it today. Um, however, the problem is that it requires a lot of compute, and so that can be prohibitively difficult to arrange for or pay for. Um, nevertheless, it should be inspiring how, what a difference two years has made because this was the state of the this right here was the state of the art in the beginning of 2016, and at the end of 2017, the, the, these were like 32 pixels by 32 pixels. Beginning of uh, late 2017, 1,024 pixels, right? And like you can see hair follicles and stubble. So um, generative models are just like um, are developing at a breakneck pace, and that's and that's why they're they're so exciting and kind of interesting to look out for. Um, these are some more examples of the generative models, like that that progressive GANs are trained for. So you can make cats and laptop computers and screens and computers and bicycles and bedrooms and stuff. When I was coming back to New York, I like used this. The, use this video as like a plea for people to help find me a place to live. <laughs> that was very, that was actually very useful. Um, oh no, we're getting slow again. Yeah, it's a lot of videos to play at once. Check it out, generative ramen. Right, and these are generative eyes made by Andreas. This is much smoother, but my my computer is freaking out again. So, um, <laughs> you might have seen this. This was made by Robbie Barrett, uh, who's another sort of neural artist that's that's uh, that made uh, these generative nude portraits. So he scraped nude portraits from wiki art and then trained one of these progressive GANs to to produce new ones. Um, so that's pretty pretty neat. Lots of fleshy parts here. <laughs> um, and also, if you, you might have noticed all of the sort of smooth interpolations between videos. So that's, that's a property of these GANs and autoencoders too, that they give us this smooth, uh, like, like latent space that we can go through. Like, and then basically, it means taking this generator and taking the vector that's being input into the generator and just changing it gradually. And then that changes the features that, uh, of, the, of the outputs of the network. Um, now, another category of generative models are ones that take in another image as input. So how many people here are familiar with pix to pix um, A lot of the like neural art projects that have come out in the space for over the last year or two have been um, examples of pix to pix or related repositories. So pix to pix basically learns image filters, right? A except the image filters are much more advanced than image filters that you're used to, like blur or sharpen, right? Those are image filters. But here's an image filter that takes labels, like a label map, and it produces a building facade, right? Or it takes a satellite image and produces a map. Or it takes sketches of an object and produces a photograph, right? Um, or uh, turns daylight images into nighttime images. So it's extremely generic, and all it relies on is if you have a data set of, of pairs of images which are related in some, in some form or another. Um, and then you can actually train a neural network to reconstruct that relationship uh, so that you can use it in various ways. I used it in a project called uh, Invisible Cities. Did you have a question? Uh, it depends on, on the relationship that you want to learn. Uh, the question was, how many images do you need? Um, it, it, sometimes as low as 100. Like, it's, it's actually quite, it's not super data intensive. That's usually, um, that may not give you the best results. Like, let's say 1,000 is a good one to aim for. Um, sometimes there, are, we have various, when we introduce pix to pix there's various <laughs> tricks we have to making your data sets bigger or producing new data sets. Um, I, I'm thinking to make a component of this class be a little bit about like data set collection, generating data sets. Um, I'm thinking about exactly how to do that, but, but yeah, data sets is usually the limiting factor. And one nice thing about PixPix is that it doesn't require as many samples as like those GANs do, um, the ones that produce images from scratch. Yeah. Um, so I use this, I did this project, a collaborative project with actually a workshop group of mine in, in Milan, uh, about, like right, right when PixPix came out, we did this project where we downloaded map tiles from Mapbox, and we learned we, we had a we had Pixipix learn how to convert the map tiles into the satellite images, and so then we could take the map tile from one city and run it through the the Pix to Pix model for another city. So like we can take Milan, we take its map, it's it's like actual map tile, and run it through the Pix to Pix model that, that generates Los Angeles satellite imagery, right? So this is. Now, Milan in the style of Los Angeles, right? 
or Milan in the style of Venice, right? And so the Venice one's kind of neat because all the roads are kind of bluish, like, like they're canals. It converts roads into canals. Um, Pix to Pix is real time, so you can actually, like not really on a MacBook necessarily, but on the computer with a good graphics card, you can actually run Pix to Pix in real time. So here, um, this is made by this, this just came to my attention actually, this is a web app made by this, um, this fellow in Yemen named Zaid uh, Al Yafi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. But basically it lets you like, you know, draw, if you go on, on this online, you'll be able to like, you draw labels into a little canvas and then it'll generate um, like a little street scene for you. Um, this is uh, work by an artist named Anna Riddler who basically, and this is kind of neat because this demonstrates a really, uh, like I think underrated use case for pix to pix which is like painstakingly generating your own data sets from like, so she literally took a movie and painted, uh, individually painted uh, a bunch of frames from the movie. So the movie is The Fall of the House of Usher, which is based on an Edgar Allan Poe book. And so she repainted many of the frames, generated a training set that had the frames of the movie and her painting depiction of that frame and generated and trained pix to pix to convert her uh, to convert a frame of the movie into her painting and then she regenerated the whole movie in her as though she painted it right so she she generated the movie which is this black and white movie and it looks as though she painted all the frames herself right so that's kind of a, a nice little way of of uh, of using pix to pix this is really nice. This is work by Memo Acton, who's um, also like very, very active in this field. So he um, and he actually has an application that, that you can download that, that does this basically. Um, basically, it runs pix to pix in real time. So here he's like um, he has a model that converts an image into like, you know, this like ocean waves. Right. And the way that it's trained is that it, it extracted all of the edge. It, it takes or, uh, the original data set was a bunch of images of the ocean and it extracted their edge maps using like, like open CV canny edge detection, something like that. And then you can throw in anything in front of the webcam and it extracts its edges and then converts it into an image of that scene. He has it like, like oceans. He also has like fire and, um, like flowers. Yeah, this is cool. Right. So fire texture. These videos are not playing very well right now, so I'm gonna move on. Um, this is an artist um, who also is like I, I just kind of uh, became acquainted with this year, um, uh, named Helena Saren, who also did something very similar with um, as like Anna's, where she actually takes he trained not pix to pix, but something called CycleGAN, which I'll show you in just a moment, um, to tr uh, to convert images of foods like various vegetables and fruits into her painting style right and she and she made some really really lovely kind of graphics here as you can see um now i i can't take credit for this mario klingerman came up with this idea of of training pix to pix on face markers um so so here's the idea you get a data set of of somebody let's say uh you know he who must not be named lord mm -hmm. lord voldemort um, and extract and use like a face tracker to extract all the faces from it and then train picks to picks. Uh, oh, actually, this is this is incorrect. It should be the other way around. So, like, you train picks to picks to go from the face marker to the face, right? And then in the real time scenario, like, I'll put myself in front of the camera, extract my face with the face tracker, and then run it through the picks to picks model that produces Trump's face. And so, basically, then you can do stuff like this. It's hideous, right? And, and of course, like this is, this is now like when I did this, this is already 2016. So it was kind of like a lot of artifacts, but you can very convincingly model someone's uh, people's faces as you're going to see in just a moment. Um, oh yeah, this is stuff by Mario. So Mario is like, Mario is kind of the master of like uh, neural, neural, uh, neurography as he calls it, neurography. Um, yeah, so this is his, I was just in an exhibition with him in, in Korea, the Biennale, and he made this thing called Uncanny Mirror, which basically you get in front of it, that's me, and then it, produce, and then it like reimagines you, um, having been trained on the previous people who stood in front of the mirror. So he's making all sorts of like really crazy neural, uh, neurography. This is from Chris, um, basically trained picks to picks on dense pose. So this is... Uh, I'm your host, yeah. Stephen Colbert, you know... 
Okay, so you got Colbert, right? Then he uses po the pose detection, dense pose, Welcome to extract to, show, I'm your host, to extract uh, like know, the position of Colbert in the in the frame, right? Thank and then he trains it to go from the dense pose because, image uh, it, to the know, real uh, image, right? So then he can put himself in front of the camera. Yeah, there Welcome he is. One and all to the Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. You know. And then basically like turn himself into like then puppeteer Thank Colbert. You. Thank you for your support because uh, I need it. You know. Uh, and then like someone else is going to come into the frame. Wounds. And who is that? Does anyone? Who? I've been trying to figure this out. Does anyone know who that is? Like. All now they're just really messing around. Stuff off before it. Unsheath yourself. Yeah. So vid to vid. This is this is their latest in this. This is this is just from a few weeks ago. Nvidia doing like really really like uh, very accurate like rendering of uh, label map to street view synthesis. Um, so that's really crazy. The craziest thing about this is the faces. These are all fake faces. Just can you believe? Can you even believe like how realistic they are? What, what um, you, is it like in, in this case, like, are the, are the new things being generated like basically new pixel by pixel in most cases, or does it end up start grouping features so that it can sort of insert more? It, uh, I'm not sure what you, what, what do you mean? But like, it, I guess like you, you have the street scene, right? And like um, there's certain elements like a, like a tree, like is like every part of that tree completely new? Or might it be pulling like stuff that it learned from the data set? Well, it's it's a little it's it's a little bit hard to to no, say well, exactly right. because because I mean of course it's new in the sense that all the pixels are being generated. However, like um, it might look very similar to something in the data set, in which case you might accuse it of overfitting, or right. it might be le learn, learning a very general feature. There's not actually with GANs especially. There's not necessarily any easy way of rigorously uh, evaluating that. Like how close it fits. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, with vid, uh, because because with vid to vid, it's actually trained on on like sequences of frames in order to ha to preserve that sort of temporal characteristic. Whereas pix to pix is just images. Um, yeah, that's why it, there's that's why it looks so like frame to frame consistent. Okay, same thing except pose to body, right? And actually, I have a better example of this. Um, so this is the coolest thing. This is I think from one week ago. Everyone dance now. This is awesome. Has anyone seen this? Okay, check this out. This is like a researcher. Yeah. So that's the target. I wish this is going smoothly. I'll have to show you the, the video later. So yeah, now it converts. So there's the source video and it takes the target person who can't dance and then it regenerates her as though she's dancing in that way. Isn't that amazing? This is a research video, right? It's like... Oh, check this out. Let me, let me go further along. Oh, uh, with vid, uh, because, because with vid to vid it's actually trained on, on like sequences of frames in order to, ha to preserve that sort of temporal characteristic. Whereas pix to pix is just images. Um, yeah. That's why it, there's that's why it looks so like frame to frame consistent. Okay, same thing except pose to body, right? And actually, I have a better example of this. Um, so this is the coolest thing. This is I think from one week ago. Everyone dance now. This is awesome. Has anyone seen this? Okay, check this out. This is like a researcher. Yeah. So that's the target. I wish this is going smoothly. I'll have to show you the the video later. So yeah, now it converts. So there's the source video and it takes the target person who can't dance and then it regenerates her as though she's dancing in that way. Isn't that amazing? This is a research video, right? Like... Oh, check this out. Let me, let me go further along. <laughs> so if any of you like are terrible dancers, um, like me, right, so she can't dance, right, apparently, 
But this guy is now puppeteering her. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Always. Wait, the next, the next one is, I think, my favorite because it, let me, let me just say, okay, this is another, like, real-time drawing interface. I'm just going to show this really quickly because um, I want to move on. We just have a few more minutes, so I want to kind of get through the rest of this stuff. But this was a week ago, and I think they say the software is coming soon. So this is, like, an interactive editor for images. So it's n not only, like, the uh, one that I showed a few slides ago, but it lets you take features and modify them. So be like, okay, I want more clouds. Decrease the amount of clouds. Increase the amount of clouds. Let's draw some mountains. Let's change the, the amount of daylight um, and, and so on. So this is kind of like, like the, I, what I wrote about this a few weeks ago is like, this is kind of like the way I imagine Photoshop might be in the future, you know, sort of full of these buttons like make this sunnier, make this outdoor scene sunnier. And so um, I, would, I would definitely expect that to be a big part of the way we interact with these things later. I want to show Cycle again really briefly. This is the same thing as pix to pix except the images are unpaired. So for example, if you wanted to convert a horse into a zebra, with pix to pix that's very difficult because you would need uh, like a data set of images of horses and a data set of images of zebras in the exact same position as the horses, right? Well, that's really difficult to acquire. Zebras are not very difficult or not very easy to make them sort of stand still in the way that you want. And so, um, so this is kind of crazy. They, they showed like, like a horse being turned into a zebra in real time, which is really just out outrageous. Like, <laughs> and notice by the way, like whenever the horse gonna goes by the pole, the pole becomes striped, right? Because like there's a little bit of sampling bias occurring. It's like not able to distinguish the like the end of the zebra's body and the rest of the world and so sometimes it makes like some really spectacular mistakes also <laughs> yeah. um, okay listen to this hey doc have you heard about this new technology are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices yes it is developed by a startup called firebird this is huge they can make us say anything now really anything. <laughs> the good news is they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey, guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Hillary is right. I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do a good job. <laughs> and then listen, and then they actually, Lyrebird, this is a company, and now their software is not open source or anything, but they um, have a demo that you can do in, uh, on their website, which seems to be down right now, but before you, I think you should be able to check it out. It ba they basically have you speak into the microphone for like 10 minutes and tell you to say a bunch of sentences and then they model your voice and then you can type into a text box something that you want to say and then it will take the voice model that they generated of you and make you say it, right? So here I did this, so I did this a few months ago in my voice and so I'm going to say these are the Harvard sentences that are used for a bunch of like, uh, uh, like various sort of like um, speech applications. So this is, this, is a, this is not me, right? So listen. Oak is strong and also gives shade. The pike began to rust while new. Thieves were off friends dessert jail. The right taste of cheese improves with age. Cats and dogs each hate the other. Move the bat over the hot fire. The hog crawled under the high fence. Act on these orders with great speed. It's pretty, pretty neat. Like it, uh, I mean, of course, it's very robotic sounding and it's lacking a lot of intonation. But it was trained in 10 minutes, right? On, like, on just a few sentences that I said. So it's, it's pretty awesome. So if you want to hear your voice modeled, I would go to that, that website and check it out. Um, just a few more examples of like uh, different kinds of generative models. Generative models for point clouds. I don't have any code. There's no code for this. So for those of you who are interested in 3D stuff, it might be a little difficult to, to acquire. But this is, I think, within the next year, I bet you this is going to be a big, big area because the only reason why we haven't seen more 3D stuff is because the data is a little scarce. And it does require more data than images, but in principle, it works in very similar ways. Um, language models condition on images. So this is called dense captioning. So this is this is kind of like IM to text, except except it does uh, composes phrases on re subregions of images. So it identifies things here, like okay, 
dining table with breakfast items, plate of fruit, cup of, cup of coffee, and so on. Is this like um, YOLO or sorry? Is this similar to YOLO? No, because YOLO is classification. So, uh, or sorry, YOLO is object detection, but then each of the objects, it's just the word or whatever the class is. Right. Here, it's actually generating, uh, it's generating a caption, like a new caption to describe it. So it's similar to YOLO in that it's, it's uh, regions, right? Um, but it's but it's not doing it's not like a fixed length a number of categories It's actually generating language. This is available online. So the dense captioning you can do this on images uh, And you can run it in real time. So this is all stuff that you can find online if you search for dense cap uh, RNN generated ice cream flavors. So this was okay. So so this um, this researcher named Janelle Shane she um, basically trained in a recurrent neural network on to produce uh, like metal band names and then she retrained it to produce ice cream flavors so there's kind of still the metal like the metal component is like in there so me yeah like bloody coffee yeah pumpkin trash break bug yeah so that's pretty funny and then these are rnn generated april fools pranks place a pair of pants and shoes in your ice dispenser put marbles in the refrigerator a meat and mashed potato sundae makes for quite the hand soap dispenser it's just like really Try using old clothes to pee. Yeah, so it's just really kind of there's a lot of stuff you could do with RNNs. Uh, this was made by Ross Goodwin, who's a former uh, former student at ITP, Lexiconjure. So this makes up fake definitions. It's a Twitter bot that makes up fake definitions to words. So like inter the plural, another term for interian. Okay, Terracare. A disease caused by strong feeling of contract between the three and two faces of the skin and sometimes in con. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wave nuts. So listen to this. This is this is completely fake piano music. Completely fake. And by completely fake I mean the samples, the audio. It's not like a person reading a score and playing piano. It's just a synthesized audio sample that sounds like someone playing piano with some long-term like coherence, right? So that's pretty crazy, right? Very crazy. Sorry? No MIDI, no MIDI, all samples. It's just generating an audio file, like all of the samples. From, from, what do you mean instructions? Oh yeah, yeah. They have a data set of like you know a bunch of audio files, a piano, and then it learns to generate new samples. Right? It generates all of the wave the wave files like from scratch. Yeah, no MIDI. Um, oh yeah, that's kind of how WaveNets work. We'll talk about WaveNets later in this semester. Uh, go on. Oh yeah, okay. Oops. Sorry, gotta get into computer's very sluggish right now. But we're we're at the end, so <laughs> we just got a couple couple more slides. Go, go. Yeah. So I just wanna we're out of time basically, so I'll just mention like a few words about reinforcement learning. We'll probably devote at least part of one lecture to, to just understanding what it is, but we may not do that much with it. We'll, we'll kind of see depending on how the semester goes. Reinforcement learning is all about like agents interacting with environments, very useful for games and game AI, things of that sort. Um, this is really important for AGI training. So like uh, the original DeepMind, which is a, a group at Google, trained, um, trained these bo bots to play Atari games. And it doesn't sound that interesting, but the thing is that's crazy is the way they handicap the system is that they only allow it, it doesn't understand the rules of the game. It only understands pixels and it has a reward signal. And then it, lear it learns under those conditions to actually play the game effectively. And this is uh, fundamentally like, um, and it uses neural networks to do so. So it like the input is the raw pixels and the, pr and the output is like a set of actions to take. So let's say it's controlling a joystick or something. Um, it learns to control the joystick, right? And that's kind of, that's what's happening here. I want to pass through this very quickly. Um, this is very closely related to AlphaGo. How many people are familiar with AlphaGo? So this is a big story from uh, about a year and a half or two years ago where DeepMind designed an AI that played 
the world's top ranked Go player and defeated him in five games. And uh, we beat Chess 20 years ago, but Go is considered much more difficult because the, the number of game states is vastly bigger than Chess. And, and that's actually not even the main reason why it's so impressive. The main reason why it's so impressive is that the way they designed the system is basically a, uh, is basically a system which is blind to the rules of Go. All it understands is board position and reward signal and re from the from the training and reward signal says like how li how if it's winning that's all it is right and so therefore it's very general and can be applied to any other kinds of games right um, so for example let me let me skip that for a second they're applying basically the same algorithm that they use to play Go to play uh, like like video games like Dota or I don't I don't know how many people here are gamers I think it's Defense of the Arts or something right and now this like like it's 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 hard to admit this that like to an ai like video games are much harder than than like the world's most you know prestigious games but um but it actually is because it's a ton of pixels it's in, incomplete information because it's you know the map is always constantly shifting and there's teams in this game so that there's all this coordination that goes into it so it's a really really complicated uh thing and they're actually attacking it and they're having some success under under certain constraints, but but nevertheless, like really impressive. And then Alpha Zero was the follow up to Alpha Go, and Alpha Zero could play not just Go, but it could play chess and other games effectively. And here's the most interesting part: it used zero training data. There's no training data. It learns to play the game from scratch by basically copying itself and playing against itself. So they have you know these, and it's reinforcement learning. It's an agent that's taking actions in, against the, uh, an opponent. Let's say. And then learning to tuning itself depending on how successful it is. So they would have two of them playing each other for hours and hours at a time while all of us are sleeping. And then it would actually learn from scratch how to play the game to be the top to beat the top players. So it's really, really impressive, uh, impressive stuff. So that that's the whole Alpha Zero thing. And then this is the last slide. Um, we might have a, uh, something to talk about decentralized AI. It's a little bit beyond, out of the scope of most of the other stuff that we're looking at because we're talking mostly about art stuff. And then this is like only loosely connected. It's it's connected in the way that I'm going to try to convince everybody by the end of the, by the end of the year. But we'll see if this ends up being a part of it. This diagram is showing um, some in, uh, very interesting effort to try to uh, a way of uh, sort of decentralizing the uh like the way that we generally interact with machine learning uh, we've learned a lot about how social media corrupts our brains basically and of course social media is nothing more than than tech companies with private machine learning models that we get to use as a service for free by ex by giving them all of our data right and then it turns out that that has lots of disadvantages and um so now there's a lot of very interesting uh, efforts underway to try to create decentralized protocols for where machine learning models are shared amongst a community of people or something like that. And it's a really, really difficult problem to solve from an engineering perspective because, well, for various reasons that, that are way, like, way too many to talk about right now, but maybe later in the year we'll talk about this. If we have this lab section um, that I'm hoping to, to promote, I'm, one of the first things I'm going to do is try to explain about this because it's kind of the thing that I'm, I'm most invested in right now. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's for another, another story. Um, yeah, the, well, I'll talk about the whole art DAO thing that's connected decentralized AI. So if you can decentralize machine learning, you can also then decentralize generative models, right, that take people's data and produce, uh, that synthesize new uh, versions of, of, of art. And if it's decentralized, maybe it can live on the internet autonomously, right? And sell, and sell art that it creates, and then p use that and use the proceeds to pay for its computation. So it's like really, really outrageous things that are now like blowing my mind personally, and hopefully they'll be blowing everybody else's minds really soon. Um, this is kind of like if you're interested in this idea, I would I would urge you to read these articles. I'm gonna I'm gonna post these slides uh, online in just a little bit. Um, okay, so tomorrow, to, first of all, okay, today I like blew your brains with all this, like all the, everything that we're going to do this, this, uh, today, not every lecture is going to be like that. Like tomorrow, we're just going to focus on how neural networks work. It's going to be way more boring, um, than, than today was. So just like for those of you on the fence about this course, like just consider like you want to learn about linear regression tomorrow for three hours, <laughs> like, uh, or, or would you rather, yeah, or would you rather not? So yeah, this is going to be tomorrow. And uh, I just want to mention, like, this is kind of this combined assignment for, t for today and tomorrow. Like, basically, between now and next week's class, like, I hope to, I'd, like, I'd love to, like, try to meet everybody, like, at least personally. Like, I'm going to announce my office hours tomorrow. 
So maybe between now and next Tuesday, we'll figure out a way that I can kind of like chat with everybody and get to know you a little bit better and try to learn your names and so on. Um, okay, so that's that's it. Um, I'll, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.